So it is time for a scripture reading. Uh, this scripture today comes from the book of Second Chronicles. So if you'd like to open up your Bibles to Second Chronicles, we'll be reading chapter 32. Second Chronicles 32. It's in the Old Testament, right after, you guessed it, First Chronicles. So Second Chronicles 32, and we're going to read verses 22 and 23. Thus the Lord saved Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem from the hands of Zech Zech Sennacherib, the king, I can't say that name, um, of Assyria, and from the hand of all others, and guided them on every side. And many brought gifts to the Lord at Jerusalem in presence to Hezekiah, king of Judah, so that he was exalted in the sight of all nations thereafter. Amen. Good morning, church. Good to be in God's house today. Um, so, you know, last week we had... Um, I think the TAA uh, music program presented to us, and that was that was a real blessing. Um, today we have children's church uh, going on, and so I think that's kind of great that you know we're doing different things. Um, and this morning, I just kind of want to extend my welcome, but also um, share with you uh, something that I've been kind of uh, studying on, um, and uh, just been going through. And I was reading about Hezekiah, and I was just kind of impressed uh, with the story of Hezekiah. And I want to kind of just touch on what does that mean for us today? Because I think Hezekiah, in a lot of ways, um, becomes an emblem of kind of our lives as well. So uh, I want to study that with you this morning as we get into God's Word. So uh, I invite you to just kind of pray with me this morning. Uh, Father in heaven, just uh, as we're here in your home, in your house, Lord, we just want to uh, invite your presence of your Holy Spirit to be with us. I invite you, Lord, to speak through me. Uh, and. Uh, help me, Lord, to lift up Jesus in everything that I say, um, that uh, what we discuss, Lord, would be a blessing to everyone here, um, and pour out your Holy Spirit and fill this place with your presence. Um, we want to see a clearer and better revelation of Jesus and what uh, you're doing for us um, currently right now on our behalf. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, King Hezekiah. Um, the story of King Hezekiah appears in three locations. Um, it is in the book of Kings, 2 Kings, uh, chapter 18 through chapter 20. You can read the story of King Hezekiah. Also in 2 Chronicles 29 through 32, you can read pretty much that same story uh, of Hezekiah. And also in Isaiah, chapters 36 through 39, you get the same story. Uh, and it's pretty consistent. Um, and this morning, uh, I'll be reading from uh, 2 Kings. Um, and however, Second Chronicles, as I was comparing the stories, brought about different, uh, different you know, details that I think uh, were very pertinent uh, and very interesting about the story of Hezekiah. Um, so we're going to be uh, looking through that. Hezekiah was the 13th king uh, of Judah. Uh, around 7, uh, 715 and 686 BC is where, where he reigned. He, one of the unique things about King Hezekiah was that he brought back the worship of the one God, of Yahweh. He, he, he brought back uh, the worship, so from destroyed a lot of the uh, idols and, and, and other things. Uh, so he was a reformer. So Hezekiah was a reformer. Um, and um, he was a very, uh, king says that he was, he was a good king. Um, and uh, Hezekiah lived through a, a period of time where he saw the nations around. Um, Sargon, uh, one of the kings of the Assyrians, had destroyed the northern kingdom. So he saw that. Um, uh, and, and so one of the things that happens is um, Sargon's son, Sennacherib, Sennacherib is um, the son of um, uh, the king of Assyria, and he goes out and he begins to make war and starts, he says, yeah, I'm going to go besiege Jerusalem. I'm going to go and I'm going to destroy Jerusalem. And um, back in those days, um, it's important to note that when countries went out to make war with, uh, with each other, they evaluated uh, certain things. They looked at you know, the size of their army, uh, they looked at their population, what kind of fortifications did these groups have. Um, you know, they, they kind of got together with their counselors and, and planned an attack. 
One of the things that uh, Senator Rep had done is he wanted to uh, destroy uh, Jerusalem, um, and he felt that you know they were pretty small, and so he goes about, and this is when uh, the story picks up in Second Kings chapter 18, uh, and I'll be reading from 19 through 37. Um, of what Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, decides to do. And I want you to notice that there are some similarities of this enemy uh, and also our enemy of what he tries to tell us. So I want you to pay close attention to some of the words that the king sends. Now back in those days, you know, they didn't, uh, you know, have email or Twitter to kind of make, you know, uh, notification to let them know. So they sent their delegation and they went out and they made a proclamation. So in 2 Kings chapter 18, um, it reads about, about um, this story where the king of Assyria sends uh, his representatives to talk to King Hezekiah and give him this message. And here's the message that he, that he sends. It says, this is what the great king of Assyria says. What are you trusting in that makes you so confident? Do you think that mere words can substitute for military skill and strength? Who are you counting on that you have rebelled against me? On Egypt? If you lean on Egypt, it would be like a reed in the splinters beneath the weight of uh, your hand. Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, Egypt, is completely unreliable. But perhaps you will say to me, we are trusting in the Lord our God, but isn't he the one who was insulted by Hezekiah? Didn't Hezekiah tear down his shrines and altars and make everyone in Judah and Jerusalem worship only at the altar here in Jerusalem? I tell you what, strike a bargain with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you can find that men may ride them with your tiny army. How can you think of challenging even the weakest contingent of my master's troops? So you begin to hear this, this message that um, the delegation comes over to tell King Hezekiah. And he's basically telling them, why, do you, why are you so confident? Do you think your God is going to be able to save you? Back in those days, when somebody went to war and they had had success, they attributed it to their deity. And so the Assyrians had had a lot of success. They had destroyed everybody who they had come up against. And so they felt pretty confident. And so as they went through, uh, the king basically, through his adversaries, starts insulting uh, Hezekiah. And um, as they do this, uh, in verse uh, 26, it says that as they heard these things that they, uh, they said that they were going to destroy Jerusalem, uh, the king's representatives said to, uh, said to them, he said, please speak to us in Aramaic, for we understand it well. Don't speak in Hebrew, for the people on the wall will hear. In other words, here were the Hebrews, and we didn't want you know, everybody else to hear what was being said. So they said, talk to us in Aramaic. We understand that, and we can speak it pretty well. And uh, because they didn't want to uh, you know, cause a stir in Jerusalem, thinking that here's this besiegement that's coming, the Assyrians are coming. And so they said, talk to us in, in Aramaic. Uh, and here's the response. Of, of the chief of staff, he says. But Sennacherib's chief of staff replied, do you think my master sent this message only to you and your master? He wants all the people to hear it, for when we put the city under siege, they will suffer along with you. So they knew what they were doing. They were very strategic about what they were going about to do. And so they go through and they make this uh, proclamation. And they also go as far as saying, following. They said, don't listen to Hezekiah. These are the terms that the king of Assyria is offering. Make peace with me. Open the gates and come out. Then each of you can continue eating from your own grave uh, vine and fig tree and drinking from your own well. Then I will arrange to take you to another land like this one, a land of grain and new wine, bread and vineyards, olive groves and honey. Choose life instead of death. Don't listen to Hezekiah when he tries to mislead you by saying, the Lord will rescue us. Have the gods of any of the other nations saved their people from the king of Assyria? So you begin to see that the Assyrian delegation, the insinuations that they are making, one is they 
they insulted them, they questioned who they put their trust in. Um, and they're trying to kind of wear them down. It's this kind of psychological warfare. Uh, very similar to the warfares that, that we uh, oftentimes face. So what does Hezekiah do? So they go, they hear this message that they have brought, and they go and tell Hezekiah, here's the message. Um, and so they take their clothes, they put on sackcloth, um, they, they weep, and Hezekiah's reaction is something that um, was something that we can learn from. The enemy, the enemy came in with this huge proclamation, um, and the questions that they asked are questions that sometimes the enemy of our lives, when we have troubles, when we have things in our lives and we're being besieged by trials, or we're being besieged by difficulties, are kind of the same questions that Satan puts in our minds to doubt who we put our trust in. Notice, the first question was, why are you so confident? Who do you think you are to trust in God? The enemy will try to bring doubt into our minds. The second one was, do you trust in words more than the might and skill before you? Or in other words, do you trust the promises of God more than the reality of what you see? And then the enemy questions and misrepresents God when he told them, you know, didn't Hezekiah, wasn't he the one that uh, destroyed all the altars? Again, that was a, just a misrepresentation. One of the things that Hezekiah did do was uh, Hezekiah destroyed the Aaron's rod. Um, you know, you remember um, the, actually the, the uh, serpent, the uh, um, Moses serpent that he held up in the, in the wilderness. Um, Hezekiah destroyed that. Uh, but he, they were misrepresenting what, what he was saying. And it was interesting that Hezekiah had to destroy that because the people were worshiping the uh, uh, Moses' uh, serpent. Uh, they were worshiping it and sacrificing to it. So Hezekiah had, had in fact destroyed it, which was uh, kind of interesting. And then the enemy also, uh, not only was he insulting them, uh, by saying, you know, you're so small, you're few in number. You know, even if I gave you 2,000 chariots, you guys can't even feel that many people to just, you know, to uh, go up against our king. Um, and in other words, he was trying to put doubt on them about their size, how small they were. Sometimes the enemy comes to us in the same way, saying, you're really not his son or daughter. The insinuation of trying to doubt who we, who we are in Jesus. And he says, don't listen to your leaders. Don't listen to Hezekiah. Uh, compromise and make peace uh, with the king of Assyria. And then they go on to say, there's no other nations that have survived us. So what makes you think that you're so special? The enemy here was insinuating that they had power. He goes, I can control this. Nobody's been able to... Uh, be, you know, delivered from our hand. Uh, the enemy sometimes insinuates those same things, right, with sins in our lives, perhaps, and says that you can't get away. He, he might insinuate that, you know, I have you. I have you under control. But that's uh, as far as the insinuations go. Those are only insinuations, because it's not really the reality. And I think in the life and the story of Hezekiah, there are lessons that we can learn about discipleship and Christian and Christianity that I think apply to us um, each and every day. Because the battles are real, we face battles. Uh, it might not be like the battles that they were fighting, but there are very si similar uh, traits to those battles that we face. Um, and so what does Hezekiah do? So in chapter 19 of uh, Second Kings, Hezekiah, he hears the report, uh, he tears his clothes, puts on burlap, and he goes into the temple of the Lord. And there, uh, they go in and then they uh, go tell Isaiah. So the prophet Isaiah said, go tell Isaiah what, what's taken place. And so Isaiah goes and he prays for them. And um, Isaiah the prophet replies to them and he says, and he says, go tell your master. This is what the Lord says. Do not be disturbed by this blasphemous speech against me from the Assyrian king's messengers. Listen, I myself will move against him and the king will receive a message that he needs, he is needed at home. So he will return from this land, where I, uh, and I will have him killed by the sword. So 
Isaiah tells uh, King Hezekiah, don't worry, I have this under control, uh, go. So King Hezekiah uh, then takes, takes what God had said, he uh, went to God and God answers his prayer and gives him the assurance that he's gonna protect him. And then um, the enemy, of course, doesn't wanna just leave, so just before he's ready to leave, he receives the message that he needs to go back home and then what he does is he sends another message to Hezekiah. So it's right before I leave, he says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna send Hezekiah another message. Like if the first message wasn't enough, he goes back to Hezekiah uh, and he says, this message is for King Hezekiah of Judah. He says, don't let your God in whom you trust deceive you with promises that Jerusalem will not be captured by the king of Assyria. You know perfectly well that the king of Assyria have done whatever they have, uh, they have done whatever they have wanted, wherever they have gone. They have completely destroyed everyone who stood in their way. Why should you be any different? Have the gods of all the other nations, other nations rescued them? And they go on through a series of examples. And after Hezekiah received this letter from the messengers and read it, he went to the Lord's temple and spread it out before the Lord. And he prayed. Many times in uh, our struggles, things that we face, how many times is, do we take and spread it out before the Lord? Do we put it out in front of Him? Or is it the last choice, you know, after we've exhausted all other options, is, is that when we go to the Lord? Um, and Hezekiah's example is uh, one that's worthy of imitation in that he, as soon as he gets it, he goes into God's house, he goes and lays it out before the Lord. So here's what he says, and he spreads it out before God, and he prays to God, and it's a very beautiful prayer. Uh, Hezekiah prays before God and he says, O Lord God of Israel, you are enthroned between the mighty cherubs. You alone are God of all the kingdoms of the earth. You alone created the heavens and the earth. Bend down, O Lord, and listen. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Listen to Sennacherib's uh, words of deliverance against the living God. It is true that the king of Assyria has destroyed all these nations. And they have thrown the gods of these nations into the fire and burned them. But of course the Assyrians could destroy them. They were not gods at all, only idols of wood and stone, shaped by human hands. Now, O Lord our God, rescue us from this power. Then all the kingdoms of the earth will know that you alone, O Lord our God. A beautiful prayer by Hezekiah. Pours out his heart to God, says, God, you alone are God. And this has been consistent with Hezekiah's mission to restore the worship of the one true God. He understands that all the other things, that all the nations and everything that's coming against him were just made by hand, that there were not real gods. So when the Assyrians come to siege Jerusalem, he goes before the Lord and pours out his heart. When temptation comes to us, we need to do the same thing that Hezekiah does. We need to face and face it full on that whatever temptations come to us and trust in God, we need to go and pray, pray to God, pray for deliverance. Just like they were fighting for deliverance, which was delivered for physical deliverance, we also have these same battles and we need to go to God for deliverance from the temptations, from the sins that will easily besiege us. We need to go to God and pray for deliverance. Pray to our God, who takes our troubles away. In 2 Chronicles 32, um, 21 to 23, um, there's a little detour in the story uh, that's found only in 2 Chronicles. Um, but in 2 Chronicles, it says that the angel of the Lord cut up all the mighty warriors and the commanders of the officers of the camp of the king of Assyria. So he returned in disgrace to his own land. And when he came to his house, uh, his God, some of his own sons struck him down there with a sword. So the Lord saved Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem from the hands of the king of Sennacherib of Assyria and from the hand of all the enemies. He gave them rest on every side. And many brought gifts to the Lord in Jerusalem and precious things to King Hezekiah of Judah so that he was exalted in the sight of all nations from that time onward. So here's a, a turn in the story. So everything was going wrong for King uh, Hezekiah, and all of a sudden things are looking good. God answered his prayer. He saved him from the king of Assyria. Things are looking good. 
the Lord has blessed him, and it said that he was magnified or exalted in the sight of all nations. Uh, all nations. So Hezekiah becomes, you know, uh, exalted. All the world at that time uh, in that area uh, sent him gifts. They sent gifts to the Lord. Um, it was an incredible time. He becomes kind of this worldwide phenomena during that period of time. So, you know, he had more followers on Twitter than anyone else. He was on every uh, show, you know, that they had back then. You know, he was there. So Fox News, CNN, he was everywhere. You could, you could see it was Hezekiah. He was uplifted. He was, you know, he had more than 15 minutes of fame. Um, he, you know, he had a lot of um, money that was coming into the treasury. Just everything was going well. Uh, God blessed him abundantly. Hezekiah was riding a pretty high wave. Uh, he said he was just magnified, larger than life. You know, when you magnify something, you make it larger. Uh, God delivered Israel from the hand of the Assyrians, therefore showing that this little tribe of uh, Judah had prevailed over this huge army of the Assyrians. And then in verse 24, we read the following. In those days, meaning in those days when he was exalted, he says, Hezekiah became sick and was at the point of death. And he prayed to the Lord, and he answered him and gave him a sign. In 2 Kings verse 20, it says, it says it in another way, it says, About this time Hezekiah became deathly ill, and the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, went to visit him, and he gave the king this message. This is what the Lord says, set your affairs in order, you are going to die, you will not recover from this illness. Period. And he walks out. And it says that before Isaiah leaves that courtyard, he goes to the palace, before Isaiah leaves, the word of the Lord comes to uh, Isaiah in the middle courtyard, and it says, this message came to him from the Lord. Go back to Hezekiah, the leader of my people. Tell him, this is what the Lord, the God of your ancestor David, says. I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will heal you. In three days from now, you will get out of bed and go to the temple of the Lord. I will add 15 years to your life, and I will rescue you from the city of the king of the Assyrians. I will defend you, the city, for my own honor and for the sake of my servant David. Then Isaiah said, Make an ointment from figs. So Hezekiah's servant spread the ointment over the boils, and Hezekiah recovered. Meanwhile, Hezekiah uh, had said to Isaiah, What sign will the Lord give to prove that he will heal me? that I will go to the temple of the Lord three days from now. Isaiah replied, This is the sign from the Lord to prove that I will do as he promised. Would you like the shadow of the sundial to go forward ten steps or backward ten steps? The shadow always moves forward, Hezekiah replied, so that would be easy. Make it go ten steps backward instead. So Isaiah the prophet asked the Lord to do this, and he caused the shadow to move ten steps backward on the sundial of Ahaz, so you can imagine, so you see this, this, this story now. So things were looking really good for uh, Hezekiah. And then all of a sudden he receives the news that, you know, get your house in order, you're going to die. So, um, you know, most of us, if that's going to happen, you're going to die. You don't get the, a notification that, hey, by the way, you're going to die, right? You just, it just happens. Um, but here, Hezekiah, you know, gets at least a warning, gets a heads up. Get your house in order, because you're going to die. So Hezekiah prays. In his prayer, he was a man of prayer, which I think is important. One of the things that I want us to take away this morning is that he constantly prayed. And he prayed and he says, Remember, O Lord, how I have always been faithful to you and have served you single-mindedly, always doing what pleases you. Then he broke down and wept bitterly. That was the prayer. And then God intervenes, tells Isaiah, Isaiah, go back, tell him that he's going to be healed. And not only does he heal him, but then he performs this um, miracle for Hezekiah, um, which says to have the sundial of Ahaz move ten steps backwards. You know, I can imagine the people that were working in the fields um, back then. Um, you know, it's almost quitting time. It's almost five o'clock. We're getting ready to go, and they're looking and sun seems to be going the opposite direction or you know and so I'm sure there were some 
people that noticed, took notice and said, well, wait a minute, what's, what's going on? The day is supposed to be over and it's still, the sun's not dropping down, what, what's going on? There was this uh, terrible thing that was happening and the Babylonians uh, and people around that area probably took notice of what ha happened as well. So something was strange, something was going on. In verse 20, in verse 12 uh, of 2 Kings 19, uh, it says, envoys from Babylon were sent. It says, soon after this, so just after this had happened, after this took place, it says, Merodach Baladan, son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent Hezekiah his best wishes and a gift, for he had heard that Hezekiah had been very sick. Hezekiah received the Babylonian envoys and showed them everything in his treasury houses, the silver, the gold, the spices, the Aramaic oils. He also took them to see his armory and showed them everything in his royal treasury, where he was, had nothing in his palace or kingdom that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah the prophet went to King Hezekiah and asked him, what did those men want and where did they come from? How many questions do you hear there? Two questions. He says, what did they want and where did they come from? And Hezekiah replied, they came from the distant land of Babylon, period. Have you ever um, noticed that when sometimes somebody asks you something, you might not be as direct and uh, might skip over the answer or start talking about something else or change the subject. Um, I know that, you know, sometimes uh, I did that as a kid when I was asked to do something. And, uh, I only partially answered the question. Um, this is kind of the, the same kind of example. Hezekiah uh, only answers, they came from Babylon. They, they came from Babylon. What did they want? That was also part of the question. Uh, but he didn't do that. He didn't, he didn't answer that question. He didn't answer that question. And so I think that's very revealing. Second uh, Chronicles 32, 31 points this out. It says, so also in the ma matter of the envoys of the officials of Babylon, who had been sent to him to inquire about a sign that had been done in the land, God left him to himself in order to test him and to know all that was in his heart. So it's interesting that God left him alone and was testing Hezekiah. Would Hezekiah do what God wanted him to do? And this is where the fascinating part of the story for me uh, takes place. Um, through trials and difficulties that Hezekiah was facing, God still kind of intervenes in his life and, and does these different things. Um, and then to this point where he changes and causes something pretty phenomenal to take place where the Babylonians hear about it. Now the Babylonians go back to Nimrod, they worship the sun. So they were astronomers. They looked and they said, there's some, something happened. And so when they said to uh, Hezekiah, when they went to him, they went to him because they wanted to know, what did God do? You know, what, what, what happened? You're, you heard you were, you were going gonna to die, and all of a sudden you're, you're not dying, like you're doing well now, and we saw this miracle that your God did in the heavens um, who the implication was your God just moved our God basically your God moved our God backwards so your means your God must be more powerful than our God and we want to know about this God that's what it was this was this that, that's kind of the implication of the story is that God had done something and since the Babylonian envoys they want to find out Tell us about your God. But yet, Hezekiah, for all the good things that he had done, yet Hezekiah, at this point of this test, uh, shows him everything. He does everything. He shows him his treasury, shows him all things, except for the things that they really came for. They came to find out about this God who had done this great miracle in his life. But yet, Hezekiah is totally silent on that issue. He, he tells him everything but the truth. He tells him everything but the truth. The enemy is relentless. First it was the Assyrians, then the Babylonians. The 
the implication for the Babylonians was clear. The God of uh, the Israelites had done something. But they missed an opportunity. Hezekiah did not share that with, with them. And so when Isaiah tells um, Hezekiah, he says, what did they see in your, in your palace, Isaiah asked. They saw everything, Hezekiah replied. I showed them everything. I own all my royal treasuries. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, listen to this message from the Lord. The time is coming when everything in your palace, all the treasuries stored up by your ancestors until now, will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. Some of your very own sons will be taken away into exile. They will become eunuchs who will serve in the palace of the Babylonian king. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, This message you have given me from the Lord is good. For the king was thinking, At least there will be peace and security during my lifetime. What a missed opportunity. Hezekiah, I rescued you from the power of the Assyrians. The plan was for you to die, but then I saved you. I magnified you, Hezekiah. I made you... Uh, bigger than life. I, 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 I made you, I magnified you in all the nations. Then I moved and returned the sun for you, all so that you could witness for me just this one time. Was it a missed opportunity? Who knows if Babylon would have learned about the true God at that time? But it was because he failed to witness to the Babylonians and answer the question about the sign, the wonder that God had done for him. That later Daniel ends up in Babylon with his young friends in another generation and accomplish what the father should have done. Missed opportunities. This morning, I would like to share with you that the message is simple. God has saved us. God has magnified us. We are his sons and daughters. Amen. We are seated with Christ in faith in the heavenly places. And he has sent us his son, he, he sent Jesus to this earth. Jesus is at the right hand of power right now. He is in the holy temple built by God, not by human hands. He is there ministering on our behalf. And the lesson for us, friends, is that we need to witness. We need to speak up. We need to share what God is doing in our lives. That is the takeaway from this morning, is that when we face trials and difficulties and the reason that things happen to us, they happen because there's a reason behind them that perhaps it's to bring others to Jesus. That we're sharing something difficult, um, just like Hezekiah. Hezekiah failed in his mission to share what God uh, had done in his life. This is from Prophet and Kings, page 347. It says, the story of Hezekiah's failure to prove true to his trust at that time of the visit of the ambassador is fraught with an important lesson for all. Far more than we do, we need to speak of the precious character in our experience of the mercy and loving kindness of God, of the matchless depths of the Savior's love. When mind and heart are filled with that love of God, it will not be difficult to impart that which enters into the spiritual life. Great thoughts, noble aspirations, clear perceptions of truth, unselfish purposes, yearnings for piety and holiness. We will ex we'll find expression in words that reveal the character of the heart treasure. Those with whom we associate day by day need our help, our guidance. They may be in such a condition of mind that the word spoken in season will be a nail in sure place. Tomorrow some of these souls may be where we can never reach them again. What is our influence over these fellow travelers? Every day of life is um, frightened with responsibilities which we must bear. Every day our words and acts are making impressions upon those whom we associate with. How great the need that we have to set a watch over our lips and guard our carefully our steps, our reckless movements, our imprudent steps. Uh, and surging waves of some strong temptation may sweep our soul into the downward path. We cannot gather up the thoughts we have planted in human mind. If they have been evil, they may have set in motion a train of circumstances, a tide of evil that which 
are power, we are powerless to stray. But on the other hand, if by our example we aid others in the development of good principles, we give them power to do good, in their turn they exert the same beneficial influence over others. Thus hundreds and thousands are helped by our unconscious influence. The true followers of Christ strengthens the good purposes on all whom he come in contact with. Before an unbelieving, sin-loving world, he reveals the power of God's grace and the perfection of his character. Perhaps as I read this story and, and, and as I reflected on this, I realized that there were opportunities in my life that maybe I missed out on, where things that I could have shared with somebody, but maybe I didn't, that I neglected to speak up. Uh, as I was thinking about what to, you know, title my message this morning, um, you know, speak up, I can't hear you, because sometimes we speak too quietly. Or sometimes we don't want to get involved with people, we don't want to connect, we don't want to get, uh, uh, we, we want a certain anonymity in our lives. But yet, um, what I see over and over again is that God calls us to a community uh, of service for one another. God calls us to serve one another, to lift one another up. And, and, I just, and as, I, as I read this story, and as I saw all the things that God had done for Hezekiah, he, he didn't stop anywhere. He, he blessed Hezekiah. He, and all he wanted Hezekiah to do was to be faithful in his trust by just telling the story of, hey, this is what God has done for me. And many times I look and maybe I've been just like Hezekiah. I have hesitated to maybe speak out the times where I should just say, hey, the Lord is working in my life and he's doing this. And, 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 or I had this trial and, you know, whatever it might be, there, I know that there are times in my life where I've held back. And I wonder, what's the consequence of that? Um, in this story, we see that there were consequences to that. And I don't want to do that anymore. And so I was inspired by just the fact that Hezekiah still, the Lord, kept acting and working in his life. And we have the story today that is handed down to us so that we can share what God is doing in our lives with others. If we're truly Christians through and through, we have nothing to hide. We actually have everything to share uh, with them because we have hope. We have the words of hope. We have the trust in Jesus. We know what Jesus has done for us and is continually doing in our lives. So we should just overflow those that things should just flow naturally for us to be able to share them with a world that really needs to hear the message that Jesus is coming back soon. And this might sound radical. Um, but the takeaway for me was that, um, you know, I don't know what you're going through in terms of maybe you're, you're in a low patch of life, just like, you know, Hezekiah was, you know, he was being besieged. Uh, or maybe it's, you know, your health that you're dealing with. Or maybe the enemy is attacking your marriage, or maybe attacking your kids, or the enemy is attacking. The enemy that uh, Israel faced is the same enemy we face. He wants to destroy our lives. He, he wants to make us uh, miserable. And he tries to break us down by not trusting in God, by questioning our, who we put our confidence in. But our confidence uh, should be in the Lord who demonstrates every day his mercies are renewed every day for us. Every day he, he gives us new opportunities to witness and share what he has done in our lives. So my challenge for you this morning is to Think about opportunities that you have or things that are happening to you. Maybe it's, you know, maybe it's not pleasant, but you get through it. And those are the stories that people want to hear. Those are the things that people want to, God will send people to you to say, what's, you know, what's going on in your life? And I just pray that when those opportunities come, that we will not do like Hezekiah and just share everything else but the truth but that we will share the truth, that we will share what God has done in our lives. Jesus has paid everything for our, for our sins. He paid the penalty. Um, and we have victory in Jesus. And that confidence um, is everything. Uh, that confidence is everything. Um, and we give credit to Jesus for everything. Uh, we don't take any credit of it for ourselves, but we just magnify God for what he has been doing in our lives. In Revelation 12, 11, in closing, it says here about how we obtain victory from the enemy. 
Revelation 12, 11 says, and they have defeated him by the blood of the lamb and by their testimony. Testimony is what we say, what we speak, what God has done in our lives. That's our testimony, how God has worked in our lives. And it says that that's how we overcome. We overcome by the blood of the lamb and by our, our testimony. And they did not love their lives so much as they were afraid to die. Let us be vocal about sharing the miracles that God is doing in our lives. Our God is at work. Nothing has been left to chance. His plans for our salvation are sure. He just needs us to witness.